Hello everyone. In this video, I am going to read some of the notes that I have taken here with you and go through a series of thoughts that are inspired by a short essay by Freud, Sigmund Freud, in this collection, Penguin Freud Reader. The title of this short essay is Remembering, Repeating, and Working Through. And I think this essay represents, in my mind, one of the most important contributions of psychoanalysis. I will also leave a link to a more recent article in the journal Behavioral and Brain Sciences, published in 2015. The authors of this article are Lane, Ryan, Nadell, and Greenberg. And that more recent article represents a more up-to-date, more uh, neuroscientifically informed, informed by contemporary research in neuroscience. But it is essentially the same view that Freud is discussing in this in this short essay, and I think a good place to, to go to in order to think about this basic insight is Freud himself. So in this essay, Freud briefly discusses the development and the task of psychoanalysis, therapeutic psychoanalysis. The task, as Freud describes it, is the process of working through transference. I'll unpack this. And working through transference is essentially working through repetition. So what psychoanalysis, the therapy, therapeutic process of psychoanalysis relies on is a kind of repetition, something reoccurring, something familiar that, we, we reoc that reoccurs within the context of therapy, and then the therapist and the, the patient, they work through that together. But that repetition is key. Something has to be repeated. Something has to come back from the past and enter into the context of that relationship between the patient and therapist, and then working through that that we at repetition. It is a working through that requires remembering the past, recognizing the past, how the past is in the present, or in other words, recognizing the fact of repetition, and looking for a way of moving beyond the past in order to have an, a true authentic relationship with the present, with, with reality. So to make this more clear, let's put forth a, a number of assumptions. There are three assumptions that we need to keep in mind as we think about what Freud is talking about here. First, there are patterns of relating to other people, there are patterns of relationship that we learn during early childhood, which are retained and later repeated. Second, the early patterns are directed at significant others, so mother, father, caregiver, siblings, early friends. So these, the, the other side of these early patterns of relationship are people who are significant to us, other agents, objects, people who are significant. And because of their significance, these relationships, these patterns, become associated with intense emotions. So what we learn is not just a neutral way of relating to other, other things relating to the world. These early patterns are also very emotionally intense and the emotion, emotional charge of them is very strong. Finally, the third assumption, is that the unpleasant elements, these patterns might include not just what is pleasant, but also some unpleasant elements or experiences. And the unpleasant elements in those patterns can result in repression. Repression means pushing out of consciousness, pushing out chunks of experience or chunks of possible experience out of our conscious awareness. But of course, repression doesn't mean eliminating something. Repression just means pushing out of conscious experience. So something interesting and uh, unfortunate happens because of the combination of this early learning and repression. So we are learning to repeat some things, the patterns, we are learning about patterns and doing and acting patterns, but at the same time, we are repressing aspects of them from our, out of our conscious experience. So the combined effect of learning, to, learning and learning to repeat and repression, that combined effect results in unknowing repetition of the past. So we continue to repeat the past unknowingly. We would unknowingly, for example, we would unknowingly attract or be attracted to people who repeat those early patterns that might be hurtful, patterns of hurtful relationship. We would unknowingly behave in ways that repeat those early patterns of patterns of dysfunction, miscommunication, isolation, and pain. And we would unknowingly react and overreact as we did before, not recognizing that 
not recognizing why a given event feels so tragic. So we might lose a friend or we might go through a breakup or somebody might say something or misunderstand what we say. And the way we re react to that might seem like an overreaction, might seem disproportional, out of proportion, too large for that event. The event itself is quite small, but our reaction to it is very big. And the event feels so tragic. And what makes it tragic is that a past tragedy is resonating within this present tragedy. A past tragedy is repeating within and taking life from what is happening here and now. So a great example of this type of tragic repetition happens in this novel. Tragic repetition happens with Adam Trask, one of the main characters in the novel East of Eden by John Steinbeck. What happens between Adam and Kathy isn't just so we are looking at it through the point of view of Adam. What happens between Adam and Kathy isn't just a unique event in Adam's life. It is a trigger that brings back and confirms an older tragedy, a tragedy that began much earlier in Adam's childhood. And he is, as you might, as you might know if you have read this novel, Adam overreacts, reacts very strongly to what happens in that relationship. And his overreaction is understandable if he recognizes where he has found himself once again, that he has found himself in a familiar position. He has found himself once again and how that place might feel and seem inescapable and familiar and natural to him. And what I'm uh, talking about now or in the, my notes writing about uh, as patterns of relationship most likely have a narrative structure. Eric Byrne, another psychologist, analyst, describes these as games, so patterns of relationship or narratives, or as Byrne would describe them, games. We could also describe them as dis discourses or general, general the concept of conversations. If you follow Rom Hare, Michael Billig, and similar, similar contributors. A narrative might begin with so a kind of story that we might repeat we might begin very positively with promise, like, wow, this is a great relationship. Promise, of positive feelings, passion, enthusiasm, but end, it's a kind of story that ends with disappointment, betrayal, and blaming each other, and so on. So we should think about that narrative as a whole. We don't just repeat that betrayal or the ending part. We, we repeat the whole narrative. The narrative as a whole might be familiar to the person. And here, what I'm going to say next, you might be suspicious about this next point, that the narrative as a whole is repeated unknowingly, unconsciously, and yet actively by the person. The person actively, even though they are not conscious of it, they actively go and repeat the whole. From the very beginning, they unconsciously are intending to repeat the whole tragic story. The, the nature of this tragic story, the identity or aim of the story or game or is confirmed most clearly, it becomes more clear, it becomes revealed by the end, when the people involved find themselves in a familiar, although perhaps very painful positions. Now, a question that we should also think about is why do we repeat patterns of relation that repeat past hurtful experiences? Why do we repeat these hurtful stories? There are several reasons, and these reasons are, are interrelated. They're related to each other. Because we, we repeat the past, we repeat the past even though the past is hurtful, because we have learned, simply we have learned to do them. We have learned, and, or we have, we, another way of saying it is, we have already invested in being a participant in that kind of story. The story has already become familiar to us, so it, is, it feels normal to, to go back to those stories, to repeat them. And because these stories afford a way of structuring time. So any way of structuring time, we can structure our life, our time, through a very tragic story. And that having a tragic story to structure time is better than not having any story to live by at all. Another reason is that because these patterns that we repeat, they are emotionally very intense and they are very emotionally strong. And because of that, they are very meaningful. So they provide us with a lot of meaning. And finally, because we are not, we repeat them because we are not fully aware of them due to repression. 
what Freud wants to do, what Freud wants to construct or wanted to and tried, is a path of moving beyond these repetitions. But, and this is the main key, the path that Freud is constructing is not by avoiding the past, avoiding those repetitions, but it is through repetition and recognize, consciously, with conscious awareness, recognizing that something is being repeated, that we are repeating past patterns of relationship, past mistakes, past misunderstanding, past dysfunctions. Repeating them, remembering them, recognizing them, being aware of them, and by doing that, having a chance of moving beyond them. This is what makes the relationship between the analyst or the psychotherapist and the patient very important because then that, that context, that relationship provides the client or the patient with somebody who is now a significant other and that significant other can be the target of patterns of relationship that are coming from the past, now maybe repeating in a way that is slightly more helpful, slightly deviates from the past and is more faithful to the actual state of affairs. Okay, um, I'll continue this discussion with a, with a reference to something more something more present in the popular culture, maybe the character of Barney Stinson that I'm, I've been thinking about in relation to this essay. And that could be a second part to this discussion. Thank you.